Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April. I am in Dallas this week and next week uh, for my classes. This week is, let me get this right this time. Oh boy, got too many things here. Vocation, leadership, and the Bible. We had two four to six page papers that were due Sunday, yesterday. That seems like a long time ago because I turned them in Saturday. And uh, yesterday I was driving here and there was a huge thunderstorm uh, that went from all the way from where I live all the way here. There was a thunderstorm the entire way. It was a horrible drive. And because last year what I did was I left at like 5 a.m. And, and then got to school. Um, or maybe I left at 4.30. And this year I didn't want to do that. So I thought, okay, let me book Sunday night. That way I can just drive in leisurely, early, you know, you know, supposedly and get rest. Well, that didn't happen because I left at one. I stopped to get some stuff to eat. So by the time I left town, it was 1.30 and then the storm was just it was awful. It was raining to the point where you couldn't really see hardly. Everybody had their hazard lights on. I've never seen that before in a storm where everybody had their hazard lights on. It was thundering, lightning. I mean, it was awful. I have a couple of videos here. I was just like, really? And then there was one time where there was an hour delay. There was, um, well, at one point there was an accident. One guy had gone off the road into a ditch and then there was a lane closed. This happens so much on the way here or the way back. They will close the lane. That causes an hour long delay. So that was so frustrating. I didn't get here till almost six o'clock and it's supposedly a three, three and a half hour drive. So I was pretty worn out by the time I got here and I still needed to work on my presentation for today. I got that pretty well done around 11 and then I couldn't sleep. So uh, to say I'm tired is an understatement right now. I think I'm going on adrenaline, but got through the presentation. Um, I had originally was gonna do a, like a PowerPoint thing or Google Slides, and I've never used it before. And my son's like, mom, I've been doing Google Slides since I was in fifth grade. And I'm like, oh, that, I'm not sure that makes me feel any better. Uh, Kind of makes me feel worse but okay so he was gonna help me with that that never happened so in our group chat we decided that we weren't gonna use slides we were all gonna do just speaking or reading or whatever so I I got it all typed out and I read it um, so I was so stressed because never had this professor before and then on day one we have a presentation so no one really knew kind of how it was gonna go or anything it went really well. I really like this professor. He's really good. And um, he did kind of some preaching today. So I will read those notes here in a minute. Uh, but so the presentation was on the two books that we did our papers on. Thought I brought them over here. Okay, so Walking in the Prophetic Tradition, Jason Bembry. And then the Gift of Administration by Donald Sr. We wrote papers on those. Those got turned in. Then our big presentation was supposed to be 20 minutes today. And I kept, I kept trying, uh, you know, using a um, timer and reading it. And I never could get to 20 minutes, even though I was reading slowly, I thought. And so today when I timed it, I think it was 15 minutes. So it was short five minutes, but 20 minute presentation is pretty long when it's just you and you're just reading and there's no slides. So, I mean, that was all I could do. Then we have another presentation tomorrow. Tomorrow is, let's see, is our calling to ministry. So he gives this Okay, on day two, students must share their calling to ministry story, and they must be prepared to receive questions and comments on the importance of their own cultural context for understanding their sense of their call or calls. Uh, so that's what's due tomorrow. He didn't really give 
a time. I mean, I mean, I'm going to check in here in the canvas thing and see. So it's worth 5% of our grade. So both papers were 10, each 10%. Presentation today was 5% and this is 5%, but I don't think this is 20 minutes. People were saying that it was shorter, but it doesn't really specify in here. So there's these four essays that we have to read on from Faith and Leadership. It's a, web, um, a website. I think it's connected to, was it Duke University? So it's about our various cultural context, how that controls how we think about vocation or calling. Um, when we think about these concepts, blah, blah. In some contexts, neither term is applicable. In other contexts, the terms are not tantamount to each other. Thus, confusion arises when we discuss the terms as if everyone begins with the same shared assumptions. So, the difference between calling and vocation. So, that's why we're doing our ministry calling tomorrow. Um, and then, something about the etymology of the terms calling and vocation. Um, Protestant reformers significantly impacted our understanding of these terms. Share your calling to ministry story. Be prepared to receive your questions and comments. Link your story to the template. Okay, so there's a template that he gives, and I don't know what I did with the template. It was here a minute ago. Exploring and naming your callings. Okay, that's it. So the template, it's this whole page long thing that we need to read. So who are you called by? What are you called to? What are you called from? What are you called for? Through, in, all of this. So we have to fill in those blanks. And then I need to post mine on the discussion board. So I have a lot of homework tonight still because I have this kind of halfway done. And um, I still haven't posted anything on the discussion boards. And there's like four things that I need to do throughout the week. I can probably do one or two today, but we were supposed to come up with our leadership. Um, I don't know why I can't think right this moment. Our leadership philosophy. And that was something we also have to post on the discussion boards. So I'm going to do that. And then we have to reply to a couple other, you know, fellow classmates to reply to theirs. That's part of the assignment. So Tonight I'll be working on that, and in the meantime, as I, as I have done in past classes, I'm going to read you my notes from today. I think I had a few other notes that I wrote down somewhere that I didn't include because um, I started typing it on the computer because that was the best way to go. All right, how can I open another word? Okay, so... This isn't really, I mean, we talked about, we talked about leadership and there's these four articles we read about leadership. And so we talked a lot about that in class. We didn't really write anything down about that. That was just things that we read that we talked about. Um, so it was um, how this one author views um, leadership and these insights that he gave that were really good, um, how, um, leaders are resilient we should look at we should look for resiliency and leaders and we don't um, what was another thing that he said um, that you don't always see success as success or success may not look like success failure may not look like failure there was these whole it was these four articles so that was really good just a different perspective on leadership so then our professor, then we broke up into groups. We have two groups. One is the alpha group, one's the omega group. I'm in the omega group. And we have to find um, some social injustice. I kind of feel like we did this last, last class, but anyway, we're doing it again. Um, a social injustice that we come up with a solution sort of for. We have to act like we are in a nonprofit and we are going to, you know, solve this problem. So we worked on that for a while. Um, and I think we know what we're going to do 
that's for our last day presentation. That's an hour long presentation. So there's only three of us in each group. So we have 20 minutes each. I think that one we are gonna do slides. Um, I think she said she likes to use PowerPoint. So we're gonna do that and it's easier when you do that because then you have you know a visual aid and you can add in videos and you know photos whatever so i'm not too worried about that it's just we have to get compile all this information together while we're doing all of these other preparing each night for these um other presentations so presentation monday presentation tomorrow presentation wednesday i think Thursday is the only day we don't have a presentation and then the final project presentation so and let's see so we did papers on the first two books then we're going to do a presentation on two of the other books there's five books in total and then I think a presentation on the other book so and then after class we have a 10 page paper due in a month from now so it is a lot to have all these presentations. Now, tomorrow is on our ministry calling, which is relatively easy, but we just have to match it up with this template thing that we have, make sure we're answering the questions correctly, blah, blah, blah. But, um, so, but the, the professor lectured for a little bit. I didn't think we would have any lecture. It wasn't really a lecture. It was more like preaching. It was like he preached was really really good I mean I was just I could not type fast enough I was like oh this is good so in this little sermonette that he gave us today um, he's talking about how Jesus called the disciples okay so in Mark 1 16 through 20 and chapter 2 13 and 14 Mark wants you to notice the calls in both stories so um, families, um, each person is leaving behind things to follow Jesus. There are stories that trail the call stories also. The miracle stories are, are the ones that leading up to chapter two, that's trailing the first call. After the second call, it leads to controversy. So I was trying to type and get all of this to make sense, but I mean, I could read, oh shoot, my Bible's down there. I can't read it. I, oh, okay, I guess I could look it up here. Okay, Jesus calls his first disciples. This is the NIV. I don't want the NIV. What's cool is you can also look it up in the Hebrew and Greek. Okay, American Standard. There we go. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. So I guess as we're doing our call of ministry tomorrow, this is really relevant to us today. So the stories that trail that give a specific type of constituent lit literary form. First, there's a series of miracles, the last of which is controversy. Okay, where is that? Chapter 2, 13 and 14. Let me get there. So he was talking about a lot of these verses like before and after and he went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them so the paralytic was healed levi is called as he passed by he saw levi the son of alpheus sitting in the tax booth and he said to him follow me and he got up and followed him so um the stories that trail gives okay blah, blah. first a series of miracles the last of which is controversy in the second, there is a series of controversies that leads to a miracle. Okay, so in Mark 1, 16 through 20, there's a series of miracles that lead up to the callings. In the second, there's a series of controversies that lead to a miracle. This helps us focus on the call stories and what is going on in Jesus' ministry. So before Mark, let's see, what am I trying to say? I think there's a story before, I have to get back to Mark the previous thing I was in here. 
Um, well, I, I'm not finding it because I didn't write it down. So he says that this helps us focus on the call stories of what is going on in Jesus' ministry. After his baptism, he goes into Galilee and proclaims the good news of God. What is at hand is the kingdom of God. The rest of the gospel he is actualizing or putting into practice. Show what it looks like and then act it out. Actualization of the announcement. He's making a declaration and then following, up, following it up with deeds that matched it. Miracles, then con controversies, then people conspiring against him. Then Jesus commissions the disciples in chapter 3, verse 7, all the way to chapter 6, verse 30. Initially, there is a lot of need, so Jesus calls his disciples to become apostles. Um, he, he, he talks about how they will become apostles, verse 13. He called them forth to be sent out. Um, the companion to this is chapter 6, 6b through 13 sending them out but there is a problem we hear about john the baptist then in 6 30 the disciples that had gone out return why does he put john the baptist in the middle of all this because then he talks about how john the baptist is martyred so it kind of like breaks that up what happens when they go out and come back some will receive you and others will not shake off the dust so in ancient travel, they would bring water to wash the dust off your feet. If they did not do this, it's a sign they didn't receive you. Um, then uh, he cast out demons. He's anointed. Um, and then the story is too good. So without John the Baptist in the middle, the story is too good. Things are done. People are helped. But in between the two parts of the commissioning scene, we all get a chance to sober up, he said. The way ministry is sometimes you have good things happening but also sometimes horrific things this is what we see and that's what i see in the icu every day what happened to john the baptist herod was throwing a party his desire was to please the dancing of his daughter they had dinner and the desire came together to produce dire circumstances that led to the death of john the baptist she asked for his head on a platter right and I use that phrase all the time. <laughs> I mean, and um, people tell me, you have such weird sayings and phrases. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know where I get them, but I do. I'll, I'll say, I'll have your head on a platter, you know, something like that. And it's like, that is so gory. And here it is. She asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter and that's how he dies. So ministry will never be simply the content of good circumstance. People helped, delivered, minds changed, but sometimes there is death and dire circumstances. People of power, there will be people of power that seek to put an end to what has been announced. The structures that are in place that try to dam up what God is doing in the earth. There is a problem within the commissions. So he's talking about um, at first there's a call, there's a commission, and then there's a correction. Um, we can call this the correction section. In chapter 5, there's a man full of demons. Jesus has a conversation with him, and the man's life changes. At the very end of the episode, what does the man request? The man wants to be with him, but Jesus says, go and tell them. The man goes forth and proclaims. In the commissioning scenes in 3 and 6, the disciples go in 6, but not in 3, even though they had been called to go. He calls them to be with him, and also the language of going forth. So here we have a man that has not been walking and talking with Jesus. He has one conversation with him and he is able to do what the disciples did not do, which is, you know, go forth, go with him. What the disciples did not do in chapter six. Our years of being in church are not what God's looking for. God can get people just meeting him in, cameo, in a cameo appearance and he can use them to go out and proclaim. And that's what happened with this miracle that happened where he healed the man or cast the demons out. So then there's the correction part. He calls, commissions, and he corrects his disciples. So going all the way from 631 to chapter 1052, there are two bread stories. One is the feeding of the 5,000. Another is the feeding of the 4,000. Then the healings of men who are visually impaired. So there's four things. There's two bread stories and two stories about healing a visually impaired. 
correction of the disciples in all four. How many people does he feed in the first? How many fish? Two loaves and five fishes. Then there's 4,000 fed in chapter 8. He has seven loaves and a few fish. He has more bread and fewer people to feed in chapter 8 compared to chapter 6. Somebody in chapter 8 asks, how can this man, man feed all the people in the desert? And they have already seen him take the bread and multiply it to feed the 5,000. So he has taken less and fed more, and they're still questioning him and asking him how he's going to do this. Isn't that what we do every day? Lord, how are you going to do this? How are you going to solve this? Um, I don't see a way. And, and so the Lord will find a way where there seems to be no way. He is. As I said before, God starts at impossible. Impossible is nothing to him. The disciples have to be corrected here because they are not learning properly. In chapter 8, 14 through 21, they had forgotten to take the bread. If you want to read that, verse 17 talks about how they don't understand or perceive right. They start off well. God prepares us in one moment for what we need in another moment sometimes. So they have a perception problem. So we have blind Bartimaeus. Um, no one is helping Bartimaeus. Sometimes communities come together and sometimes they don't. They were asking Jesus to help Bartimaeus. They are in fact against him. So he has to fend for himself. They are telling him to be quiet. Chapter 8 and 10 are different. We could see this in the Greek. We would see it in, if we could see it in the Greek, we would see it in a more powerful way. So I know it's jumping all over, but he's, he's giving a sermon here and I'm trying to get the essence of it. Um, so there's two ways to talk about the past in Greek. You can say simply, he cried, he cried, which is an act. Or you could say he is crying. So the eros tense is the first. The other tense is durative. Even though they told him to be quiet, he continued to cry out, Jesus, son of God. So blind Bartimaeus, they told him to be quiet, but he's continuing to cry out. He's not going to be quiet. It's like, I'm going to keep crying because I'm not going to let my harvest pass. He knows that Jesus can help him. The text tells us something that he never does again. It says Jesus stood still. Um, because the man kept crying out, he stood still and made the people who wanted him to hush call him. And when he received his sight, he didn't go home or somewhere else. He followed Jesus on the way. Why are these vision stories important for us to learn about Jesus correcting the disciples? In chapter 8, 9, and 10. Um, in 8, the passion resurrection prediction, and then also in 9, where he says, I'm going to die and arise. After each case of misunderstanding, there are three instances of each. There's a call to correction, all squeezed in between the healings. So it's like he's performing these healings to show them, you know, to give them this lesson that he's trying to give them, but then he's having to correct them because they're not getting it type of a thing. So verse 34, take up his cro cross and follow me. In the correction episode, there are two things wish or want language. Desire from the Greek word fellow and then paradoxical language. Chapter 9, there is passion, resurrection, prediction, verse 31. The case of mis misunderstanding is that some disciples wonder who's going to be the greatest while he is talking about dying. The call to correction there is verse 35. Whoever wants to be first has to be last. Mark is repeating in 9 what he said in 8. Now go to chapter 10, verse 32. More details are given about his plight in Jerusalem. There's a misunderstanding in, in uh, chapter 10, 35 through 45 about James and John. Peter in first, all the disciples in the second, and now James and John, the heavyweights. They say, we would that you would do whatever we want. So he's talking about here the plural, we want is the plural from Thelomen. Jesus uses the second person plural, theolot. Whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. Multiple uses of the thelo language. Jesus says, what do you want? So now go to chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. There's a second healing of a blind man. Jesus asks the same question that he asked James and John, but here he is using a singular, what do you want? What Mark is focusing on is what they wish for, their desires. This takes us to the crucible. Another Thelo word. It's what the Father wants. 
So he's taking us from our desires, what we wish for. So the disciples were saying, we wish that you would do what we want, you know, and who's going to be the greatest among us. And so he's taking that to um, the father's desires, which is to the crucible. Like you may have to lay down your life. You know, so your will, and I just did a, a video on our will. Um, if you surrender your will to God, God's will, then it may lead you to somewhere you don't want to go, but is ultimately God's will, which is good. It is what ultimately needs to happen because it, he, his sovereign will is what brings everything together in the world. So even though you may not see how it fits, it does fit. Um, it does fit there. So um, it's like a tapestry. And someone said, um, you turn the tapestry around, you see all these threads going everywhere, but it all connects, it all makes a beautiful picture. And so if you think of yourself as in a story and his story, which is history, it's all going to connect. My mentor calls the Bible one long sentence. So it's, his story and we are characters we are people in his story and if we want to do his perfect will then we are going to act out what his sovereign perfect will wants for us in this story in our moment in time because we are born at a time where um you know it's such a moment for, for such a moment as this as esther said you know, we are born for such a time as this. So wherever we are in history, God wanted us born today so that we could hopefully meet and, and fulfill his sovereign will and perfect will for our lives, which would play out perfectly in his story, the character that we are to play. So that's why my greatest desire is to um, play out that character to the best of my ability to the perf most perfect to his most perfect will if possible have i messed that up many times absolutely but my desire is to get it as good as i can so it's kind of like god gives us a script when we surrender our will so we take our script and we tear it up he hands us the script that we are now to play in his you know divine movie divine we are we are a character in his story where was i so he is dealing with their wills if you get it wrong you won't make it to the crucible so if god if jesus had had not surrendered to the father's will he wouldn't have made it to the cross because I'm sure his self-will did not want to do that. I mean, if you're when you're in your flesh, you know the pain and all the things you're going to go through. But when you surrender your will, then you do that perfect thing that leads to, you know, the redemption story. So, this is the basic question of ministry. What do you want? Do you want seats of power and prestige? they the disciples wanted to sit on his left and his right in heaven or do you want sight so that's the question he was posing to us today with this um, sermon that he was giving is ministry about elevating your status status is that what we want ministry should be about seeing better so blind bartimaeus was able to see and we all have scales on our eyes, especially we can't see the spiritual realm. So even though, even without seeing the spiritual realm, we all have scales on our eyes that would cause us to not see even things in scripture. So I've said this before, if you are going to mock the Bible and then read it or think it's, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you don't have that posture you don't have that reverence for it then god will allow those scales to stay and you'll be blinded and you won't it won't make any sense to you when you read it if you in humility say lord i want to know you and i want to know your your word and then when you read it 
it will make sense and he will reveal to you because he'll start taking scales off of your eyes. He'll start taking blinders off your eyes and help you to see clearer. So that's why, you know, a lot of devout Christians read the Bible and it's like amazing. Oh my God, every day I get this new revelation, you know, revelation to me, not revelation, but um, I could read this scripture 50 times and then I read it one day and oh my gosh, the message there, it just popped out. Um, and that's what happens the more that you study and you in the scriptures and you read non-christians would say I don't see anything there there's nothing there it doesn't even make sense well God's not allowing it to be revealed to you is he so there's that okay this is going to turn into really long because <laughs> I have like three pages of this okay so ministry should be about seeing better so we can follow Jesus better. That's the fundamental question for all of us to ask. It's simple but profound. Get that solved and your ministry will take flight because you have what it takes to deal with crucible times is what he called it, crucible times. So when you're in the ministry, you're going to have a crucible moment or crucible times or multiple or whatever. So he's saying ministry is not just the accolades and the bed of roses and all of that. Ministry is in the trenches and deep and painful, which is where I am in the ICU every day. Although I do see beauty a lot of times and I do see amazing things, but it's also the crucible moments. Okay, Jesus tries to correct, let's see. Uh, Get that wrong and you will stumble and falter in difficult times. Jesus tries to correct this in the disciples. Chapter 14, when people wanted to see him from his family, quote, those that do the will of my father, that's my brother and my sister. So he's like, these. everyone is my family, right? The word is thelema, those that do what God wants. This is a noun. The others are verbs. He is part of the family of God by saying that about his will. To be in the family of God is to align our will and wishes to what God wants. Life is preparation for crucible times. So this is how he put it in his sermon. It was just so powerful. I wish I had video of it. That is the story of Mark. It's a biography of Jesus too. It's also about us and him preparing us to face crucible times just as he did to remain true to our convictions, ready to oppose the powers that be. And he did it because he was able to say, not my will, but yours be done. So we have an example in Jesus. Jesus is not asking us to do something that he would not do or that he did not do. He did this in his life and he paid the ultimate price. So whatever crucible we're gonna have is not going to be like what he had. Okay. He was willing to align his will with that of God. That's the story of Mark. He also gives us an anatomy of failed discipleship and the ways we can go wrong. It extends a second chance. So in chapter 14, verse 28 and 16, verse 7, after I'm raised up, I go before you. They are going to fail him right there on the spot. He's talking about the disciples. Peter will deny him. Judas will betray him. So if you've experienced betrayal, which I have, and one and some were very recent, um, it's something that also Jesus experienced. They're going to fail him right there on the spot. He's already predicting that they will have a second chance. So he's already talking about the second chance that he gives because God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and however many chances it's going to take for you to get on the track you need to, to get. Now, there is a point where that will end. I mean, that doesn't go on in perpetuity for you know eternity, but he will give you chances because he is long suffering. So however long it takes, however stumbles you have, however many, you know, whatever problems you face or times that you fall down and get up, he's going to give you another chance. And this is what he's saying that we should do for others, which I try to practice in my life also. Now there is a limit and there's always going to be a limit. You're not going to give, you know, it, it depends on what it is in, in life. It depends on a lot of factors. It depends on, um, you know, each circumstance has its own set of, of things that you have to uh, evaluate. 
but in here he's telling us how he knows that Peter's going to deny him and he knows that Judas is going to betray him and he's already talking about the second chances that they will have. Let's see. This isn't just about failed discipleship. There's hope in this gospel. When the women arrive at the tomb to anoint Jesus, the body is not there. The young man tells them, um, but go and tell the disciples and Peter. So Peter was a disciple. So he's saying, why did he say and Peter? Because Peter was at a place where he was denying Christ. So he calls that out. He's like, you know, Peter feels like he's not a disciple now. Or Peter, Peter's denying Christ, so he's fallen. And, and he's telling him to go tell them. So this is similar to chapter 14, 28. His word is true just as he told you. This marks rec reclamation, reclamation. We don't see the reclamation, but we trust the promise of Jesus. Peter is a disciple. Why did he say, tell the disciples and Peter? Because he was most in need of a second chance. Takes, he takes Peter, he calls Peter's name out. He draws a line. So he said, draw a line and put your name in there. So how would you feel if you're the person that denied Christ? You're the person that stumbled and fell. You're the person that sinned so badly that you didn't don't think you can get back up because I'm going to tell you right now that's one of the traps of the enemy is he will lead you down this horrible road. He'll he'll have you to fall and then he will beat you down with condemnation and tell you that you are too far gone for God. And he is telling us right here in Mark that he is a God of second chances. Peter, I know you're going to deny me, but there is still something redemptive about you. So when, when God sees us, he looks at our soul, okay? He looks at us um, with eyes that we, we don't know how to look at people through those eyes. We really don't. But if we were to look at people's soul and see their redemptive qualities, then that is what God would have us do. So when you're in a situation where it requires that you evaluate, am I able to get past this? Am I able to do this? You know, I know that, that, that those redemptive qualities are there. Is this person desiring to get back on track? Is this person desiring to be, you know, um, the best they can be with Jesus and get back, you know, into full, uh, what do you call it, um, restoration or not. So you evaluate all those things, but Jesus isn't saying that right now. He's just saying that you are going to have a second chance. For every moment we have failed and felt like we let God down, Mark's gospel says we are included in the second chance. You cannot get so far from the grace of God that you cannot be reclaimed. And that is what God wants us to know here. That's what Jesus wants us to know right here. You can be reclaimed. You can be pulled back from the enemy. You can be snatched back. That is one of my favorite verses that God will snatch people from the fire. So the enemy thinks that it, they have that he has them and he's pulling them down into the fire. God will reach down and snatch them out of the fire. That is powerful. And that's what he's doing with these second chances. The gospel offers us all a second chance, a chance to follow Jesus and have him be our teacher again. It's a second chance for Jesus to teach us again so we can get the lesson right. Hopefully after the second, fourth, or eleventh time, when we go before our crucibles, we will say, not what I want, but what you want, Lord. So how many times is it going to take for you to get back on track, for me to get back on track? Is it harder with every chance? Yes, because you're going to have to not only, you're going to have to now deal with condemnation, guilt, shame, all the things that you may not have had to deal with before, but those might be the things that bring you to a sincere walk with, with Christ. So who knows? I mean, you know, is that what it takes for you? to get on track? I, I don't know, only you can answer that. So this is really long, longer than I thought. 
So he he did a little sermon in the middle of the class, and then he did one at the end, a really quick one. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good, and I don't want to miss this. And it was like 20 minutes. So he does this trilogy of parables in Luke. There's a good Samaritan, the prodigal son. Um, he talks about Luke 10, 25, all the words of compassion in them. So he's talking about compassion. The thing with the good Samaritan, um, I may have to... I may have to do this another day because this, I may have to do this for another video because this is a whole nother thing, but um, we were, yeah, I'm gonna save this for another video. <laughs> Take care guys, I'll see you in the next video.